Hi, thank you. Now, I used to work as a professional magician, entertaining people with tricks and illusions. And during my time working as a magician, I was always really fascinated by how the psychological principles used in magic can be used to fool the mind. And in many ways, it was sort of this fascination about fooling the mind that sort of inspired me to afterwards study psychology and then afterwards now turn it into a profession. Now, Many of the principles used by magicians to manipulate what you see are actually really closely related to kind of the things that scientists are interested in. And towards the end of my PhD, I actually realized that there's a really close link between these two fields. So for example, magicians use misdirection to make their elephants disappear. Scientists interested in attention sort of like try and sort of study attention and work out how, for example, attention can make you respond quicker to a certain button. Now, I know magicians are a bit more impressive, but in actual fact, the kind of principles that the two are actually investigating are really very similar. Now, I'm currently a lecturer at Goldsmiths University of London, and my main interest really is to try and understand the principles behind magic. And we've been forming a new science called the science of magic. And the idea behind this science is really to sort of exploit some of the knowledge and experience that's been acquired by magicians for thousands of years in terms of sort of manipulating what you see to sort of further our understanding of human cognition and the mind. So the main aim here really is to kind of like to form links between magicians and scientists and sort of like for scientists and afterwards to use this experience to learn more about how the mind works. So I'd like to give you an example of this, which is misdirection. Now, people commonly think that magicians hide their secrets by carrying out their things really quickly and using speed to hide their secrets. However, this notion of the hand being quicker than the mind couldn't be further from the truth. Because in actual fact, magicians carry out everything at a normal speed. Instead, what magicians use is a process as known as misdirection to manipulate your attention so as to prevent you from seeing things happen. And I'll just give you a quick demonstration of um, how misdirection works. So, um, can you all see on this table? Okay, it's very quick. So you, have to, you don't have to applaud. <laughs> it's not real magic. Um, quick question. How many of you failed to see how the light had disappeared? Most of you. OK. Um, I'll do exactly the same thing again. Um, I've got a lighter just down here. Um, it's exactly the same thing. How many of you now failed to see it? Most of you saw it. Well, it's not real magic, because here, the light is just being dropped in full view. However, misdirection is being used to manipulate your attention so as to prevent you from actually seeing it. And so I'll just talk you through sort of like some of these principles of misdirection here. So I'm using a whole bunch of cues really together to orchestrate your attention. So I'm looking at the lighter. Um, I'm picking it up, lighting it. Um, this produces sort of like a sort of a bright spark, which hopefully will capture your attention. Um, I then look at it. These are known as social cues, so kind of like using where the magician is looking to direct your attention. So I'm looking at it. I pretend to pick up the flame and move it over here. Now, this is the point at which I need to prevent you from actually looking um, at the lighter over here. So I'm kind of throwing absolutely everything at it. I'm looking at the hand, I'm using sound, so I'm snapping my fingers, I'm moving it, looking at it, everything put together that hopefully prevents you from seeing the lighter um, dropped right here. So what's really nice about this is that it's all happening right in full view. So how is it that you failed to see the lighter being dropped? Because it's happening right in front of your eyes. Well, in order to understand this, we need to sort of learn a little bit more about how vision and attention works. Now, anyone who's tried to save digital images or videos onto their computer will know that processing this kind of information requires powerful computers. 
And every time you kind of you upgrade your camera and get higher definition, you require increased computing powers for your computer. You have to get a new computer and upgrade to the computer so that you can actually process this kind of information. Now, information processing in the brain is really similar as well because processing visual information requires a lot of cognitive resources. Now, unlike with your home computer, when you increase the images in terms of their definition, you can't just upgrade the brain. It'd be lovely to think that you could get a chip to increase your RAM and your memory inside your mind, um, but that's not how the brain works. So instead of sort of like increasing processing power, the brain has opted for increased efficiency. And the way this efficiency works is by the visual system really only selecting the information that is of actually of importance, and therefore sort of reducing the amount of information processing that is necessary. And it's attention that's actually driving this information selection system. And attention works on several different levels. The first level is through eye movements. So we tend to move our eyes sort of several times per second. And usually you don't really think about where you look. But in actual fact, your eyes are automatically picking out the information that is of importance. And in order to actually really understand these mechanisms, we need to look a little bit at the physiology of the eyes and how vision works. So what I have here is a diagram of the eye. And you can think of the eyes a bit like a camera, whereby you've got an object out in the world, um, and the image of that object is projected through the lens onto the back of our eyes, which is known as the retina. Now, on the retina, we've got lots of photoreceptors that are encoding all of the visual information, and then afterwards sending this information through the optic nerve to our brains for further processing. Now, this is really where the analogy between the camera and the eyes stop. Because in the camera, we've got a uniform distribution of photoreceptors. And what this really means is that you've got the same definition regardless of which part in the image that you're actually looking at. The eyes are very different because in the eyes, we've got a very high density of photoreceptors in a very small area known as the fovea. And then when you move out towards the periphery, the density drops off. And what this really means is that in terms of sort of like information capture, we're getting an image which is a bit like your 12 megapixel super camera right here in the center. And then as you move towards the periphery, it's a bit more like your cheap rubbish mobile phone camera. So just to illustrate this um, here, um, this is the way that you sort of capture an image with a camera. And this is the actual information that the brain receives. So as you can see, we've got high acuity information right here in the center of the center of the visual field and now in the periphery it's much more blurred and this reveal information is really very small so if you stretch out your thumb it pretty much covers the thumb so it's a very very small area now the drive to increase the sort of the efficiency of the information processing doesn't stop there because attention happens on several levels um, of the visual field. So as we've seen here, um, first of all, the eyes reduce the sort of like the high definition information that we're having to process. But the further process, lots of further processing that happens inside the mind. Because most vision happens inside the mind, not necessarily in your eyes. So even once the information has actually been sent to the brain, covert attention acts and sort of reduces the actual information that has to be uh, that has to be processed so as we can see the brain is really very very efficient at prioritizing the information that is of importance and this sort of this selection mechanism happens on two levels so it happens through eye movements whereby our eyes select the information that is of importance but also later on in the brain um, where all of the irrelevant information is basically got rid of so why do people get misdirected why do you fail to see um, these really obvious events now, 
In order to address this question, we've been sort of like using eye tracking um, to study why people are misdirected in magic. And the way eye tracking works, we, this is sort of like an image um, of one of these eye trackers. Um, it's basically a pair of glasses um, that's got two cameras, um, one of them at the top, which basically films what the person is seeing, and then we've got another camera that films, exact, films the eyes, and then after a calibration process, we can work out exactly where people are looking. Um, so what I have here is a, if it does move on, uh, move on to the next slide. What I have here is a video clip um, of someone actually watching one of these misdirection tricks. And what you'll be able to see here is this small black dot. This is the fixation point. So this is the, the point at which the person is actually looking. Um, and if you think back of sort of like what I've told you about the fovea, this dot here is about the size of the fovea. And so just watch what happens. Um, so as you can see, um, this person is perfectly being misdirected by the, by the misdirection and just looking exactly at where the magician wants the person to look. But in order to really understand why people fail to see these things happen, we have to look at where a whole bunch of people actually look. So what I have here, um, I've got sort of like a whole bunch uh, of participants looking at these magic tricks and it's split it between those who actually missed it and those who saw the object being dropped. Now, how many of you think this was the, the, the people over here who missed the object being dropped? Show of hands, hardly any, uh, a few. How many of you think it was the people over here who missed it? Most, so most people think um, it's the ones over here. Well, the results are actually really surprising because in actual fact, these are the people who missed it. And what's really interesting about this is that we've got a case here of someone who's actually really looking at the object being dropped, yet completely fails to see it. So what this really shows is that in order to be able to actually see something, it's not enough to just look in the right location. You also have to attend to it. So looking is not enough. You also have to attend to it. Now, we've been sort of showing, sort of using a lot of these misdirection tricks that in order to be able to see something, you have to attend to the right location as well as look there. And this has got sort of wide-reaching pra wide practical implications as well. So, for example, if we look at accident reports, people frequently report that they were looking at the car in front of them, yet they failed to see it. So how is this possible? Well, the reason why they didn't see it is because they weren't actually attending to it. And this is really the reason why, for example, driving while speaking to someone on a mobile phone is so dangerous. Because even though you may think that your eyes are on the road, if you're being distracted by the phone, it means that you won't be able to see the oncoming traffic, and that could lead to accidents. So, what a lot of this work has really shown is that in order to be able to see something, you also need to attend to it. Now, in the science of magic, we're really interested in sort of like using some of the principles and misdirection and under to, to learn how that influences what we see. And whilst magicians use misdirection to prevent you from seeing things happen, we, are gonna, we can actually use these principles to alert you to see things that you would otherwise fail to see. So, I'd like to leave you with a final thought. Now, misdirection has shown you that, in actual fact, you're really not aware of most of the things in your environment. You might think you're aware of them, but sort of research and a lot of this work on misdirection shows that, in actual fact, you really don't really take much notice of it. Now, you could sort of like come away with this sort of thinking, well, that means I'm really, really stupid. The fact that magicians can misdirect my attention and make elephants appear, that means I'm really, really thick. Well, that's the wrong way to look at it. Because what I've demonstrated here is that the actual visual information that the brain is receiving is really very, very limited. But how is it then that you can actually drive at 70 miles an hour on a motorway? You can walk through a really busy train station without bumping into someone. Well, the fact they can actually do this based on all of this limited information 
means you're far from stupid. In actual fact, you've got a really beautiful, amazing, efficient visual system that can sort of like carry out these tasks without having to upgrade your brain continuously. Thank you very much for your attention.